Amen. Well, what do you do when one of your best friends is going through one of the worst tragedies of their entire life? What do you do, best friend? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. And you just got word that your neighbor is, just went through the biggest tragedy they've ever been a part of. Like, how do you handle that? I, I remember getting um, a call from one of my neighbors. He was, he was one of my neighbors, and then he moved away. And he called me, and he told me, Todd, you know, I, I wanted to reach out to you and ask for prayer. I got some bad news. I came down with cancer. It's not looking good. They're gonna have to amputate my leg. And he, he reached out to me as a neighbor who, you know, you know that neighbor you build relationship with, but it's not like you're really tight with them. And he reached out and, you know, th th my heart just uh, right away just breaks. And you're like, what do you do? You know what I'm talking about? Like, do you have that question? Like, you really want to help. Your, your authentic heart is to help, but you're like, how? What do I do? What, what, what do I not do? What, what do I say? Do I get my car? Do I go over there? Is the relationship close enough where I actually they want me there? Do they want me just to back away? You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and you're like, how do I navigate th this season? It's a challenge for me as a pastor because sometimes it's like, you know, some people want you there like up in your grill, hugging you, like praying for you, crying with you. Some people are like, yo, you don't know me like that. Pump the brakes. You can pray from afar. And, and there's this interesting thing, I think, wouldn't you agree, like, who, who actually wants to help people that are really struggling? Raise your hand real quick, right? It's, it's just, I think it's worldwide, like, we really want to help, but, but the question is, how? I was watching Monday Night Football uh, this past Monday. Uh, we're my football people here, okay? Like, we're my non-football people here, so I can see y'all. Okay, there is the door. No, I'm just messing with you. I'm messing with you. I know I talk about, I'm just trying to be who I am, and I'm just trying to use real life. Well, you know, I'm watching this game, and this guy, DeMar Hamlin, he, he's safety, makes a tackle. It's a pretty decent tackle, but it wasn't anything crazy. And he, he goes down, and then he tries to stand up, and, and, and out of the blue, he has a cardiac arrest, and just like, it looks like he's doing the nasty plunge. He like falls back on his back. And you're like, you're watching this, you're like, what in the, what, just, what, what is that? And people are like, how do I react? The announcers, like, what do I do? The coaches are, what do I do? The players, you can just see the players, they're like, like what, what do you do in this, in this case? Because everybody's heart is like, they want to help. Like, what do I, you know? And there's this times and there's these places that you go, man, I, I don't know how to handle it. There's, and I'll be honest with you, man, like, there's been... Sometimes I feel like, you know, I've, I've done the right thing or I've said the right thing. And I'll be honest with you, there's some times where I don't think I, I think I've failed. I, I've told this story before. There was a really good friend of mine whose sister got really sick and she was literally dying in the hospital and I got busy. I just had a lot of responsibilities or, or, or did I just make the excuse because you go, man, I don't know what to say and so I get busy. I miss out on a great opportunity to, to be there for one of my great friends while he's going through the toughest season while his sister is dying and I don't even show up. It's a deep regret that I have. Are you with me? You know, have you, have you, sometimes you feel like, man, I've, I've done the right thing and sometimes I've just actually just completely fumbled. I've had the right heart, but I didn't handle it right. So you go, pastor, can you help me? I'm like, no, not really, but I'm hoping God helps you through me. Remember Job, if you missed, go back and listen to last week's teaching if you didn't listen. Not saying that I'm sweet or whatever, but it's just good for context for you to understand where we're at. Job, richest guy around. Out of the blue, I mean, this, it's wild because it says he's like this blameless guy. You know, if he was some knucklehead, sinner, gnarly, evil guy, I could see it. This guy's a blameless guy. And all of a sudden, like, there's this, this interaction with, with Satan and, 
in God. And Satan's like, the only reason he actually worships you is because you blessed him so much with all this resource. But if you take it away, he'll curse you. And it's this interesting dialogue that you go, is that really happening? And, and God allows Satan to, to do this. And I mean, in, in the course of one day, all of his goods and his kids, and they're all just taken away. And, and we see this powerful response of Job where he, 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 more, he tears his robe, he throws you know, dust on his head, and he's overwhelmed, just weeping, just uncontrollably. And then it says that he, that he worships. So that he weeps and he worships. And we talked about what happens on our worst day. Could there be a balance where we absolutely, we weep, but we worship this, this balance? And that's what we learned. Well, this week, it's, well, what do you do if you're a friend? What did, what did Job's friends do? And I alluded to, I actually started this study. I gave you a little precursor. The friends start out the right way. Remember what they did? The three homies like traveled from quite some distance and, and they come and, and they just, they're with Job. They're actually shocked. You'll see it. We're gonna get into this. They're shocked and they're overwhelmed and, and they do the right thing because it's called the ministry of presence. They, they're with him for a week and don't say a word. Didn't say anything. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just show up and shut up. Those are gonna be your two points here in a second. Can I say shut up in church? I don't know, maybe be silent, okay? Don't judge me. <laughs> if you're a note taker, you can just write it down. You're, so what to do, number one, show up, and we're gonna look at it. Show up. Number two, shut up. If you can't write that down, just put silent. <laughs> just be silent. Let's start, because let's just start with what they do well, because this is just going to give us some, and again, this is not exhaustive, but this is, we're, we're trying to grow together. We're trying to mature together. We're trying to help as many people as we can that are walking through really tough seasons of life. We don't, we, we, we don't want to say the wrong thing. We want to say the right thing. We, we don't want to do the wrong thing. We want to do the right thing, and we need some help. And so, number one, show up. Let, let's pick it up in Job chapter 2, verse 11. Just go right there. Job chapter two, verse 11. So again, this is after Job has walked through this chaotic thing. Oh, by the way, after all his material goods are taken away, then God allows Satan to affect him physically. And he comes down with this horrific disease and all these boils and like he's in this tremendous pain he's walking through as well. And he still doesn't curse God. His friends show up. Let's check it out, verse, verse 11. It says, when three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he had suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Underline that. What a great heart, comfort and console. They traveled from their homes. They did something about it. They showed up physically, sacrificially to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz, the Temanite, uh, Bildad, the Shuhite. Apparently, Bildad was the shortest of Job's friends. He was only a Shuhite. So, jeez. <laughs> Gotta weave those lame pastor jokes in there. Make sure y'all are. And uh, Zophar, the Joe Namathite. Okay. <laughs> Dang, that was lame, but. I was studying this and I was just thinking they, they got word of what happened to Job and they immediately sacrificed and, and traveled along. It wasn't like they could just hop in their Tesla, like charge up and like be there. Remember, this is the ancient, you know, Near East and, and they, they're taking a long time and it takes a long time to get there and sacrifice, you know, time with their family and everything and they're, they're, they're sacrificially showing up in his life. Physically, they, they're, they're stopped. They're pushing pause on what they're doing. And this, that's, I was reading this. I was so convicted because, again, I've done it wrong so, so often where I don't want to sacrifice my agenda or my schedule for the sake of meeting someone that's walking through a tough time. That, that's, that's convicting to me. These guys... 
He didn't care how, how far away they were. They, they pushed pause on their, on their schedule and, and, they, and they showed up at the right time, this, this ministry of presence. One of my best friends um, is a business owner and has an employee, young guy, that came down with ALS. And he told our small group the story of just this week had the privilege of going down, I think he lives in Lincoln, I wanna say, so he, he pushes pause on, on leading his business, his family, all the responsibilities, and he just shows up and just ministers to his friend, his coworker, the wife, and these, these little kids that if God doesn't step in and perform a miracle, God's gonna take this man home. And he pushes pause on his schedule and he goes and, and you know what? Does he have the right word to say? Is he gonna fix everything? Is it, no, but what, what can he do? Can he pray? Can he give a hug? Can he have some interaction with the kids? Yeah, he can. What can you do? Like, what does it look like for you in these relationships that you're with? And by the way, have some, have some social awareness of like what the relationship is like. In this case, this is a, a key employee that he's been investing in, and now he sacrificially shows up for this person in the craziest of circumstances. Praise for the family. It's something that you and I could do. It's, it was interesting when Damar Hamlin went down, you just can imagine, it's, it's never really happened in the NFL where someone has a heart attack on the field and has to be resuscitated right there on the field. And you can imagine the play stops and then the coaches are talking. What do we do? Do you continue on with the game? What, what, what do you do? And the Bengals coach and Sean McDermott, the Bills coach, they have this conversation. And, and this is what was said by Sean McDermott. He's like, I can't be coaching here. I gotta go to the hospital and be next to my man. I gotta be next to my guy. What is that? That is, that's showing up. Like that is, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but you know what? I'm gonna show up for my player. And, and they stopped the game, and that's exactly what happened. The GM, I think, got on a plane from Buffalo, flies down to make sure he can be with this player. It's showing up, showing up sacrificially, physically. What does that look like for us? I would encourage this. Lord, what are you inviting me into? How can I serve this person in this season? How can I go the extra mile? What, what is it, what is socially appropriate with the relationship I have with them? What does that look like? And then you act. Go above and beyond and sacrifice to show up. Not just sacrificially and physically, but I, I wrote my notes emotionally and spiritually showing up. Look at the next verse, Job 2, verse 12. This hit me. When they saw Job from a distance, so again, you know, the little dude and the rest of the guys, they're, they're coming in and they're, they're, they see Job from a distance. They scarcely recognize him. You, ever, you, know, you haven't seen a family member or a friend that has been taken with a disease and now you show up and you're like, man, I don't even recognize him. That's what's happening here. He's got boils from head to toe. The guy's in extreme pain, extreme agony, completely depressed, losing his family. They, they scarcely recognize him. Now watch this. The friends, they wailing loudly, they tore their robes, threw dust into the air over their heads to show their grief. They showed up and engaged very authentically, being real, being vulnerable, and letting emotion out. Have you ever been to that place where you show up and you're like, do I cry, do I not cry? Like if I cry, is that like bad because they're trying to hold it together and, and you're actually gonna make it worse if you start crying and engage emotionally? Have you ever had that? What do you do? And again, this is between you and Lord. For me, I would just rather be real. If you're overcome with grief, just like the friends, wail, cry care. Maybe that's the way that you show up that act, it is, you're with them. There's a Bible verse that I want you to jot down. Romans 12, 15. I like this one. Romans 12, 15 says this. Rejo re rejoice with those who rejoice. I was going to sing. I'm sorry. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. 
me talk to some of my friends that you've walked through a really tough time. Is it okay for your friends and really close people to come over and just weep with you? It's wild because when, when this went on a Monday night with Damar Hamlin, and I, I think they might have a couple of pictures of some of the players, and this is, this, is, this is what was happening. On the field, as they see their friend, they could barely recognize him because he's on a stretcher fighting for his life, and, and, they're, and, the, and these grown men that are supposed to be the toughest dudes in the world are just overcome emotionally, and they're just letting it out. They're showing up emotionally. There, there were announcers that were, were, were losing it. This is something we can engage and we can support and we can help and we, we show up emotionally. How about showing up spiritually, praying for people? One of my friends that I've known for years, and I mentioned this last week, had, had this tumor in his head. He had surgery to take it out. And one of the things I've been trying to do, and I know this guy is a little more private, doesn't want a lot of attention, but he's been on my heart all, like, all the time. And so what I've been doing is just sending him texts of encouragement. And you know how like you, on, your, on your text you can click the little thing and just send an audio text? This, I'm just trying to give you a pro tip. Like, like maybe they don't want you over there hanging out with them, weeping over and crying over them, but maybe it's something you can show up spiritually with an with a authentic, honest prayer for them. Just click that, it, and they make it hard now. You used to be able just to push it, the whole thing. Now you gotta like find it, click it, and then click it again. But nonetheless, like... Just authentically from your heart, pray for the person. And he texted me back another audio text, and he's like, no one's ever prayed for me over like audio text in my life. And there was nothing like, I'm trying to be a good pastor. I'm trying to be, like, I just really care for the guy. And I'm like, I can't imagine having a tumor the size of a protein shake in my head. I can't imagine the pain that he's gone through. It was really cool hearing his response. He's like, man, I, I just... I trust God no matter what. I believe that Jesus Christ is, is, is my Lord and Savior, and, I, and I'm, I'm just gonna lean in, and whatever he wants to do in my life, I'm gonna, the, the, the biopsy hasn't come back yet. He's like, I'm just gonna trust in this season. I grew, and I pray that I was just some small support in that place. There was a guy on national TV Dan Orlovsky, I don't know if some of you guys caught this. I'm sorry I'm, I'm talking about this, but this is just real life. And, and this is NFL Live with millions of people watching live. And this, this guy on the left, Dan Orlovsky, he says, we've all been saying about, you know, we'll keep DeMar, you know, in our thoughts and prayers. He's like, I'm just gonna pray right now. Well, you can't talk about this. And how about, how about there's a guy fighting for his life and I'm just gonna push pause and show up sacrificially and spiritually and in front of, I don't care, you can fire me if you want. I'm praying right now because I believe, he said, I believe in the power of prayer. <laughs> I was like, oh, go ahead, Dan. Dan the man. Powerful. This ministry of presence showing up, the ministry of prayer. You know, and then there's sometimes just to shut up. That's number two. I put in parentheses, sit down and be silent because I know some of you guys don't like that point. Just put down, sit down and be silent. Look what it says in verse 13. Job chapter two, verse 13. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. The Jews back in that day, they had this tradition where if someone passed, they had a family member that would die, they would mourn for seven days. And that's kind of what's happening here. Job's kids passing away tragically with this tornado taking them out and they show up, they sit down, they're silent and they're just with him. Again, this, this, this ministry of presence. 
Sometimes I would just say this. Sometimes less is more. Who, 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 like, who in the room or listening online, like, you, you always are thinking, I got to say something right here. Like, I got to say something right now. Only two? Okay, good. Well, a lot of us struggle with this. We're like, dude, I got to say something. I got some of the best advice from one of my pastors in Fort Lauderdale. He said, when you're leading a graveside service, less is more. Less is more. Your presence there, if, if it's socially right to give a warm embrace and a hug, he said, maybe read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's gonna be with me through the valley. He said, a lot of times, man, like that's, that's what it is. Less talk, more just authentic embrace. There's a story, and we're gonna read about it when we get to the prophetic books in Ezekiel. And I, want to, I think it's in chapter three, yeah. Chapter three, verse 15. And it's an interesting story. I'm guessing Cap's gonna be preaching on this, so maybe this will be preview for you. But it's an interesting story because if you remember, God's people got off track and the Babylonians came in, conquered them, and, and took them captive. And they're in, they're in captivity in this place. And God sends Ezekiel, the prophet, to go, to go actually call them out. But when the very first thing that he does, look, look what it says. He came to the captives at Tel Aviv, who dwelt by the river Chebar. And what did, he, what did it say? I, this hit me. I sat where they sat. And I remained there astonished among them seven days. You know what hit me when I was reading this? They sat where they sat. There's something about just like sitting with someone, just where they're at. And if you can be, you know, in that moment, put yourself in their shoes, there's something spiritual that happens and, and powerful in that place. Those of you ladies that have had a miscarriage, for example, like when you have so, like a really close, again, remember, a close friend, and they show up and they're just with you, isn't there something powerful about that? Why? They're just with you. They're in your shoes. They're, they're sitting. They're not saying a lot, but they're the ministry of presence, they're there. There's a lot more to this, but let's move on. Those are just a couple quick little things they did right. And in chapter three, if you read it, after a week of silence, Job opens his mouth and he begins to curse the day that he was born. Remember reading that? I, what I love about this is he didn't curse God. That Satan thought he would curse God. He wasn't cursing God. He was cursing the day that he was born. And how many know when you go through the worst tragedy of your life, that's how you feel. I just, I just want it to be over. I want the pain to end. And that's what he goes on and on and on about. And you'll see for chapters, you're gonna see this dialogue with Job crying out and then his friends saying some dumb stuff. <laughs> and so I'm just gonna cover just a couple of quick things, what not to do. Y'all ready for what not to do? <laughs> Number one, don't accuse. Don't accuse. In Job chapter six, verse 14, it says, one should be kind to a fainting friend, but you accuse me without any fear of the Almighty. You accuse me. So what was happening? His homies first show up in the right way, but their theological understanding that Job must have some secret sin. If, if this happened in his life, it's certainly God's judgment or trying to get his attention. So they are accusing Job of some secret sin. And Job's like, great, thanks guys. Now, we know that it said that he was a blameless man. It wasn't anything to do with this. Now, let me just say real quick, by the way, there are times where God is allowing chaos in your life to get your attention. Did you know that there is divine discipline? Let me show it to you. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse five. Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. And this, this is really good. Watch this. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. 
as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God's treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who's never disciplined by his father? What am I saying? It could be that God is disciplining you, but it very well could not be. And that's the tricky thing. Don't right away, you know, when, you're, when your spouse, like they just blow out their back, oh, dude, he's, you know what? He is in secret sin, for sure. <laughs> your wife, you know, blows out her shoulder. Well, she must be doing something bad because God got her. You know, it's like, hold on now, pump the brakes, maybe. You know how many times I blew up my hamstring and got a concussion and blew up my shoulder? Guess what? That was divine discipline. God's like, I got something better for you. You can't keep on acting this way and going down this road because I got something way better for you. So guess what? I'm gonna get your attention now. You think you're going to the NFL? Sorry, buddy. Bam. And what happens? You're flat on your back so God gets your attention and you turn from living your own life and just ruining your life and everybody else's and now something changes. That's divine discipline and that's possible. But the problem is, Job's friends are just accusing him of secret sin. What are they, God or something? They know it? Spouse or your kids? Your kids, you know, did some, you know, got hurt. Well, for sure they're in secret sin, maybe, but maybe not. Don't accuse. Number two, don't assume. Don't assume. It's really in the same vein. Job 6, verse 29, <laughs> Job is crying out to his friends, stop assuming my guilt, I've done nothing wrong. And we know that because God said it himself. Maybe even worse, Job 8, 4. I was reading this, I was like, man, you better not. If you're my friend and I'm walking through a tough time and something happens to my kids, if you ever tell me this, we're gonna have some problems. You, look, look what it says, your children must have sinned against him, so their punishment was well-deserved. Can you imagine the audacity of a friend telling you, yeah, your kid died because he was off track and God needed to smoke him. Thank you, that was great. I really appreciate all your encouragement, buddy. Don't assume. Don't accuse. Don't assume. There was a, a story in the Bible where some of Jesus' disciples were off track in this whole thing in John chapter nine, and they, they, there was a man born blind. Do you remember this story? And, and they came up to Jesus and they're like, yo, um, who sinned? Was it this dude that was born blind or was it parents? Like, why was he born blind? Do you guys remember that? So this, his own disciples were like Job's friends, accusing and assuming that something was off. And I wanna I don't, just jot it down real quick. John 9, 2 and 3, they said, Rabbi, you know, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins, his parents? Look at verse 3. It was not because of his sins or the parents' sins. This blew me away. Jesus answered, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Now, now here, here's, here's a little asterisk, and then I want my friend to preach for you guys. I gave her five minutes, and she took all five minutes. So this is powerful because in John chapter nine, it said the guy was born blind, so the power of God could be revealed. Could it be that some of the chaos that happens in our life actually is an opportunity for God to be exalted because even though I'm in my worst season, I'm still a Christian and I'm still worshiping God and the outside world is going, how on earth is that happening? I got a solid faith in the good times and in the bad and now people are like, now that's what I want because in this world of chaos and darkness and, and upheaval, People like never before are going, what is true? How can I never be moved? And could it be God's using your tragedy to point people to him? That's a powerful thought for those that are, have the courage and the faith to be allowed the privilege to have pain and point people to him through the gnarliest season of your life. That's crazy. This is one of my friends and she's gonna give you a couple tips, but let me just set up the story. I alluded to her story. Amazingly gifted young lady, recently married, this is years ago, gets in a horrific accident. Her, she miraculously made it. I have no idea how she made it. Husband passed away. 
Their spiritual mentors, good friends of ours, passed away in the car accident. And the process of how God has been comforting her and by God's grace, what he's done over the last handful of years will boggle your mind and how she gives honor to God. And I just asked her, would you be willing just to share? Because it's one thing for the pastor, like I'm sharing this, and you're like, yeah, whatever, Todd, what tragedies happen in your life? You really don't have a platform to share. And maybe you're right. But I tell you, this woman right here has a platform to share and to help us on how we can help others that go through that. You, got, you guys ready to, to hear my friend preach? And then we'll land the plane. So if you could roll that video, check this out. Hi, Love Church fam. Just wanted to share with you some perspective from my own experiences and maybe some tips of how we can best love and serve people who are going through tragedy or walking through grief. I think one of the most important things is to really know your role. I like to think of it as an inner circle and an outer circle. Both roles have a lot of value, purpose, and ways that we can share and love on people who are going through hard things. The inner circle are people who are really close, family and friends to that person, and they're going to be involved in the more intimate decision-making and conversations and probably spend the most time with that person. The outer circle, those friends, acquaintances, or maybe just we are empathetic for that person who is hurting and we want to help them. We can do a lot of practical things from afar, like making meals, shoveling driveways, mowing the lawn, pulling weeds, sending them groceries three months, six months, nine months down the road, just to take a load off their plate. Another thing that's important to remember is that there's different seasons after tragedy. I think the first season's kind of survival mode and it's chaotic, there's a lot going on. And one of the questions that can actually be really hard is how are you doing? If you know they're not doing very well, maybe approach them and make statements like, I know that things are really hard for you right now and I'm praying for you. Or better yet, ask them how you can pray for them right there. After you go through that survival mode, uh, the next season is really grieving. And grieving, as Job talks about, can be so heavy, as heavy as the sand in the sea, and it feels like a full-time job. So it's important for us to have grace upon grace. Invite the person who's walking through a hard time to things, but have zero expectations of them showing up. Just continue to reach out in love. Also, um, as time goes on and people's lives move forward as they should, the person who's experienced tragedy or loss still has a void in their heart and it can be very heavy and hard to deal with. I think one of the greatest things that we can do is being a t intentional about specific dates that might be hard. Birthdays, anniversaries, anniversaries of when tragedies happened and just put them in our iCal pray for the person and send them an encouraging text to let them know that you haven't forgotten and that you're thinking of them and praying for them. Praying is one of the greatest things that we can do. It legitimately works. I've experienced healing physically, spiritually, and mentally because of people's prayers. Pray for people who have experienced tragedy to have comfort. comfort. Pray for them to have direction. Pray for them to have hope. And then the final thing that I would say that we cannot underestimate is the power of God's word. One of the greatest gifts that I received in my season of tragedy and grief was people texting me God's word or mailing me index cards of verses that I could hold on to. God's word is living, breathing, and can provide hope. 
So I always say to people that if you want to do something now to help people in the future who are going through tragedy, take the time to study and memorize God's word because it's the greatest gift that you can give anyone. I pray that these things are helpful and that you will all go and be the hands of and feet of Jesus to people who are hurting. Love you all. Powerful. It's interesting. I was texting back and forth with Emily and she said, this, this kind of hit me. She said, after a few months, there was a lady that showed up to her house and all she would do, she'd show up and just pick weeds in her yard and then she would leave. And she said, even something that small was sacrificial by showing up and doing something practical. She wasn't there to even, she didn't even knock on the door, didn't try to like spend time. She, all she did was a very practical thing like that. And I just thought, you know, any of us can do that. What is it? Show up sacrificially. Be quiet, be silent at times. Lean in, be a support. Again, what not to do, <laughs> accuse, assume. We are the body of Christ. We are here for one another. And Jesus said, again, in this world, you will have trial. You will have trouble. He doesn't say you might, you will. But man, let's, let's, let's be the church. Let's support. Let's not judge. Let's not accuse. Let's not assume. Let's just, let's be the hands and feet of Christ. Amen. So God, thanks again for this opportunity to lean in at this time not real comfortable, not real easy, but more and more, so many people struggling and the enemy ruling the airwaves of the world and chaos. And I just pray, God, we'd stay steady, stay strong, secure, be spirit-led in how we're supporting those hurting in this season. Give us a, a gift of mercy, grace, patience, sensitivity, social awareness, spiritual awareness. Equip your saints in this season, in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna just give an opportunity for those here that have never placed their faith in Christ, you've never surrendered your life, maybe you've heard about God, maybe you grew up going to church. If you're really honest though, you, I don't, you've never really got to this place where you place your entire faith in Christ. And I wanna give that opportunity before we leave here today. So if you don't absolutely have to be somewhere, if you're a Christian in here, maybe you're online, can you just begin to pray? There's hurting people in here. I was thinking, it's one thing to go through a tragedy and, and have faith to know that even though you can't figure it out, God's got a plan and I'm gonna trust him. I'm going to heaven. I'm gonna see my loved one in heaven. There's, there's some type, something about hope. I was thinking though, what if you don't have eternal hope? What if you're walking through a trial and you don't have God's presence to be with you and God's word to guide you? Maybe that's you and maybe today's your day to go, man, I, I want a sure foundation. I'm gonna surrender my life to Christ, place my faith in him. I need forgiveness. Maybe today's your day. In tomorrow's reading, I was reading ahead. And this verse from Job chapter nine completely struck me. Because Job is actually asking the question. He said, if only there was a mediator between us, someone who would bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. I was like, oh my goodness, he's prophesying of Jesus the one true mediator that would take the beating upon him for my sin. I was like, what's Job doing in the Old Testament talking about Jesus? 
In 1 Timothy 2, 5, Paul's writing to young Tim. He's like, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So we got Job and we got Paul all talking about the one mediator to bridge the gap between a holy God and the rest of us. That's powerful. And if you think of Job, <laughs> this is a, a repeated record throughout all of the Bible. You have a perfect blameless person brought into this chaotic realm, suffering unjustly, and at the end, praying for these sinners and having forgiveness and then being restored or resurrected. Can you see the gospel right in the book of Job? Beautiful. So let's stand together and I just wanna give this invitation if you're in need of forgiveness, redemption, do you need a mediator? Can I just be very honest with you? The Bible's clear, God is perfect, the rest of us are not. We need a mediator. We don't work our way into God's good favor. We don't, we don't do a bunch of good works and then somehow arrive in heaven. We place our faith in the one true God, Jesus Christ, the mediator who lived the perfect life and bridged the gap. We're reading in Romans right now too. It's this, it's this beautiful gift. It is a, we receive this gift of salvation by faith. Do you want that gift today? Do you wanna know beyond the shadow of a doubt when you step into eternity, God will forgive you and you'll be in eternity for forever and ever. Maybe joining loved ones. That's the truth. One God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It doesn't say two, doesn't say all roads lead to heaven. There's one way, his name is Jesus. Do you want that? As the band plays, I'll invite you to come forward. This is for you online as well. It, it's humbling yourself before God, placing your faith. I'll lead you in a prayer. God, open up my heart. I wanna follow you. I need forgiveness. I wanna place everything, all my faith on what you accomplished on the cross. Three days later, I rose from the grave. I believe in you. We'll connect you with some friends. Don't do life on your own. Begin this journey together growing in Christ. If that's what you want, God's reaching out his hand. The invitation's there. So church, begin to pray. Van, play. If God's speaking to you, you come now. You come now. sing anymore. Maybe you're in the nosebleeds. This is for you. Maybe you're online. This is for you. Anybody else? We're not singing any longer. Just come right now. It might be a little scary. I'd way rather come now before men, though, than eternity, just kind of rolling the dice on my eternal future. Come now. Come now. I love what Jeff says. Rise. Your heart's pumping. Maybe hands sweaty a little bit. God's inviting you. Anybody?
let me just look into the camera because I know people, and you're sharing these messages and people are coming to Christ online. So for the benefit of those, let's lead, there's someone right now, you say, man, this is, I, I need God, I need forgiveness. I wanna surrender my life to Christ. If that's you, pray this prayer, say, Lord God, open up my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, to be my savior, to be my friend. Forgive me of all my sin and wash me clean. I decided today, early 2023, to follow you, Jesus. From this day forward, I'm yours. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me in a life of love for your glory and to help a ton of people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.